Hello, I'm the Angry Spork, taking issue with DC Comics' Centurions miniseries. Last week, we saw Ace McCloud, the guy that thinks flirting with women is the same thing as being lucky with women, get tricked by the daughter of their arch-nemesis into a big subterfuge plot. Cause he's a moron! Also, we got some backstory on the Centurions, but it was like a page apiece, so... What are you gonna do? It's a toy line based comic story. Next up is issue three. The cover sees our heroes flung into the air by the violent eruption of a volcano. They tried warning Max against swimming in lava, but the man takes his double dog dares very seriously. Hey look, an image of Ace McCloud's face that doesn't inspire nightmares! There is a god! There may be hope for this series yet. We begin on the Isle of Puhiti, where a team of scientists were trying to harness the power of the volcano for alternative energy. Not only was it unsuccessful, it's now endangering their lives, as they are seen rowing to a larger boat to get to safety. Row faster! It's going to blow any minute! We're in a technologically advanced society! We have teleporters and high-speed vehicles! Why are we in a rowboat? On board Sky Vault, Crystal and the Centurions are watching the havoc unfold, attributed to Mother Nature's unpredictable personality. The people in danger can't be beamed up because the transporters only work on people wearing exo-frames. Or our spies seducing Ace McCloud for their terrorist fathers. Though that worked because she was holding on to McCloud and he was probably wearing his suit underneath his clothes, so maybe if the Centurions all got together and did a bunch of group hugs with the scientists, it's worth a shot. Also, Lucy looks like something out of Dr. Seuss here. Weird. Anyway, they transport down with Max helping some, I guess, island natives to a boat. Well, Ace flies Jake so he can shoot a hole in the volcano to relieve the pressure, aided by Crystal's analysis pinpointing the right spot. The boat is pulled to safety before it can head out on its own power, while Jake is given the right spot to hit and launches a plasma shell. The volcano explodes unexpectedly because there was a miscalculation. Oh, I've got to uh, carry the water. The shockwave hits the Centurions, rendering them unconscious as the lava begins flowing. So they're beamed back to Sky Vault before they become crispy critters. We jump to some time later in their secret underground base in New York, where the three have woken up. When two of them begin speaking, but none of them can hear, Max deduces they've all gone deaf. Crystal walks in, and when McCloud asks for a kiss, it's Jake's dog Shadow that makes tongue contact instead, much to his friend's amusement. But if they're deaf, how do they know why that's funny? Unless Ace is so predictable, they automatically assumed he'd hit on Crystal the moment she walked in, and thus shoot him down. Wait, that actually makes sense. Crystal writes on her pad, with impeccable calligraphy I might add, that their eardrums have been damaged temporarily from the eruption, and explains out loud that they're grounded until they recover, and that their condition is kept secret, with only their doctors knowing the truth, while everyone else is told they're taking a break. Not sure why she suddenly started talking, other than maybe the writer didn't anticipate that a 21st century society would have personalized communication devices that can each receive the same message from one sender. It can't be for the reader's sake, they're already reading. In his Arctic Fortress, Doc Terror says he's intercepted and descrambled a transmission that suggests the Centurions aren't really on vacation, but seriously injured. Even if they're not too incapacitated, his latest plan will take care of them along with everyone else. He's designed a subsonic disruptor to hypnotize those within the Centurion's underground base into his slaves so he can overtake Sky Vault. Then he and Hacker are in the base because Terror has methods of extracting information, whatever that's supposed to mean. And then suddenly the notorious supervillains were in the hero's base. The two put in their earplugs while in sickbay, Shadow seems disturbed by something. When that's followed up by Crystal entering into a trance-like state, Max can tell that something is wrong. His demeanor is enough to tell the other two that something is wrong as they get dressed, and they make their way to the control room. The technicians are hypnotized as well, and while they exchange dialogue they can't hear, one worker opens an entrance from the subway. He might be in a trance, but he's got a full cart of tickets and he's getting that free six-inch sub. Ace reaches Sky Vault, saying that they've got an emergency and need their exosuits, 
but because he can't hear their multiple requests for an identifying code word, they figure it's an unauthorized call and basically hang up on him. Funny, they didn't think to send text communication like how most people communicate in the actual 21st century. A security door opens, revealing the culprit behind this attack. The grouchy red bionic erector set, surprised to see his enemies somehow immune to his disruptor. Perhaps on instinct, the Centurions continue to state the obvious and banter as they evade laser blasts. And to show how dumb 80s supervillain goons could be, Hacker points out that they're escaping and has to be ordered to do something he does fairly regularly and try to kill them. Flee like the cowardly mice you are, Centurions. I'll track you down wherever you hide. Because my large, blocky, and asymmetrical body is perfect for fast movement. <laughs> Before long, the three decide to split up, each taking a different route to a storeroom so that at least two of them will make it, rather than risking all of them getting taken out at once. When Hacker, having somehow lost track of them, comes to the three paths, he takes a moment to choose one while his quarries have reached the room. They suit up, but only have sparse gear, no complete sets of their weapons, having to mix and match. Not unlike what kids could do with the toys, hint hint. Hacker hears them and laser cuts a hole in the door, and keeps calling them mice for some reason. Did he hit his head while watching Tom and Jerry or something? Is there an infestation of their arctic base? What is it with him and tiny rodents all of a sudden? A single laser blast KOs the villain, and the Centurions each suggest they split up. Even the pilot, after telling them to stop talking like they aren't all hearing impaired. They each head off in their own direction with Rockwell eventually running afoul of some hypnotized technicians. He tries low-level attacks to break free, but they soon overwhelm him, looking angry and disturbed. I thought insurance salesmen were pushy! Similarly, Ace is running from one group of allies turned enemies right into another. He tries flying, but the daring air operations expert hits the ceiling, unable to maneuver because his sense of balance was lost along with his hearing, and he's soon swarmed as well. These workers aren't actually hypnotized. They want to try selling Jake and Ace each a timeshare. In the control room, Doc Terror is enjoying his unwilling slaves about to tear his enemies apart. Now, Miss Kane, find Max Ray. It's Dr. Kane. I didn't study all those years to be called Miss Kane. Also, a please wouldn't kill you. However, Max must have bumped into something because he's right behind him. He dodges a blast, thinking that maybe Crystal was right to ground them, irrelevant as that is at this moment, as Terror insists his underwater gear is useless in this fight. You do only use Super Soaker technology, right? We've never fought one-on-one, -on -one, so I figure the rockets and the laser guns are all for show, because if they were real, I'd be a dead man-bot. A laser blast to, I guess, a sprinkler head causes water to rain down, more pouring than sprinkling, and Terror thinks he was going to wait until the room filled with water to fight back. Turns out, as Ray announces aloud, he's going to use his hydro thrusters to charge the enemy. Doc tries increasing the power to his subsonic disruptor, presumably to bring Ray under his command, but the Centurion collides with him and knocks him out. He turns it off, which renders all hypnotized personnel unconscious. Ace and Jake arrive with Hacker in tow, and realize that the disruptor has cured their deafness, because why not at this point? so they'll hang on to it for research purposes. And finally, with their enemies in their grasp, out cold after having attacked their base, they can't lock them up because they have diplomatic immunity. It was one thing when the rest of the world couldn't hypothetically attack his base, but he's not here on diplomatic business. He's straight up invading. Son, you are dumber than a bowl of mice. One of them, I can't tell who because they're miscolored, has an idea. The timeout corner. Oh, wait, I forgot. Diplomatic immunity. No, instead, they just put the two in a crate, hammer it shut, and send them through the facility's mail processing area with no actual address, just a couple notices that read immediate delivery anywhere on Earth. Apparently, they deal with the world's foremost terrorist determined to kill and conquer the same way Garfield deals with an obnoxiously cute kitten. Though, I freely admit, I might have given the book a few more points if they'd addressed the box to Abu Dhabi. Teleporting their gear off at will without a teleportation system, I guess. They wait a while until Crystal wakes up, 
not knowing why they're out of sick bay and in their exosuits. She marches them back to their beds while they all simultaneously decide it's funnier if they pretend to still be deaf. They pass by signs of battle and woozy, battered technicians waking up. Dr. Kane asks the Centurions what happened, but Max answers that they're still deaf and don't want to strain themselves explaining what happened. The comic ends with Crystal asking how they could answer if they couldn't hear anything, as our three heroes keep up the act. Just remember, she can teleport you into space whenever she wants, guys. That was the Centurions number three, an interesting challenge for our heroes that really didn't seem all that challenging for them in the end. As a bit of a change of pace, our heroes face a threat that has nothing to do with Doc Terror, even though I kind of expected him to be behind the volcano somehow. Giant robot iguana or something, I don't know. It was actually kind of nice seeing them do something a little atypical. Losing their hearing is a nice idea, and I thought it was a bit clever that it made them immune to hypnosis. I can understand them still talking, if only out of impulse or habit, but it didn't seem to deter them that much. Max's inner monologue seems to indicate he gets the hang of lip-reading, but it doesn't come into play or affect the story. Sure, they couldn't contact Sky Vault, but the way they seemed more or less capable before then, you'd think Ace would have remembered he'd need an access code, and realizing he wouldn't be able to hear the satellite crew's response might start stating it in hopes of them doing as he requests. And how they got better is pretty sketchy, too. A subsonic disruptor putting people into a suggested trance? I'm willing to entertain, suspend my disbelief. But ramping up its power to cure their deafness is really just a feel-good quick fix to their problem. Despite Crystal talking to them after putting their condition on a big sign, their eardrums were damaged. So apparently with enough energy, the disruptor can just rapidly heal that specific injury? Good to know for anyone with chronic hearing problems. You do not want tinnitus. The story also glazed over things that could have been clever or interesting to see. It's not a huge deal to keep it vague how Doc Terror knew about the secret base, but he and Hacker are two very conspicuous people that are half mechanical. How do they just waltz inside? Cloaking technology? Killing or paying off some guards? If you wanted to say he caused a distraction by having all those unlicensed costume characters in Times Square start dancing to walk like an Egyptian, fine, at least show it! Though you think if his device was so effective he would have gone to, you know, the World Council and hypnotized them to make him ruler of the world or something. However, in real life, hypnosis has its limitations. You can't make someone do under hypnosis something they wouldn't do of their own free will. And... The World Council probably wouldn't turn over control to him, and it's debatable if Crystal would follow his orders either. Another common oversimplification the story uses is that of diplomatic immunity. They can't just imprison their international terrorists, so they put them in a box with a sarcastic mailing address. Weird given the dialogue where they talk about making sure the zip code is correct. I guess these sociopathic cyborgs are your problem, Butte Montana. Heck, the post office might even return to sender, figuring it was a prank. And speaking of pranks, if this were an episode of the show, I could see their animated counterparts playing this same joke on Crystal. Though it is kind of a jerk move, considering everything that's just happened. Though alternatively, I could see Ace claiming to still be deaf, then saying Crystal can tell him how she truly feels, then she tells him he can take a leap. Specifically a flying leap, because you know, pilot. On a minor note, I'll give it this much. At least they didn't have the native-looking inhabitants on the island be technologically ignorant. They seemed very aware of the world they're in, not dumbfounded by the Centurion's gear or anything. Mileage may vary on them wearing what appears to be animal skins, but hey, maybe it was casual Friday. The issue wasn't terrible, but didn't live up to the potential of its premise. Though that feels kind of expected for a toy commercial comic. Next week, we look at the final issue of the miniseries, and possibly the last bit of official media until it gets inevitably rebooted and someone claims it's ruined their childhood. I'm the Angry Spork, and man, have I got issues.